Yeah, but it's yeah, Dear participants, this is a Zoom webinar. Please note that all video and audios are automatically off. If you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type them in the Q&A box and the moderator will address them during the Q&A session. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good day to everyone. Thank you for joining us in this World Engineering Day webinar. Yang berbahagia, Academician Emeritus Prof Tan Sri Dr. Mazan Osman the co-chair of International Conference on Tropical Sciences, TROPSI 2024, senior fellows, fellow of academy, member of Young Scientists Network Academy of Science Malaysia, partners and affiliates, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our 10th pre-conference webinar, part of the Future Belongs to the Tropics webinar series. This webinar series celebrates the tropics and highlights the importance of science and technology in the region. Additionally, it serves as a lead up to International Conference on Tropical Sciences, which the Tropical Science Foundation and the Academy Science Malaysia will jointly host in October 2024. This webinar is a joint effort between the Tropical Science Foundation and the Academy Sciences Malaysia, where we are celebrating World Engineering Day team engineering solutions for sustainable world, focusing on engineering for a greener tomorrow. So before we begin, Please welcome Academician Emeritus Prof Tan Sri Dr. Mazan Osman, the co-chair of our upcoming international conference in Tropical Sciences, TROPSI 2024, to give her a welcoming speech. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to another TROPSI 2024 pre-conference webinar series under the Tropical Architecture and Engineering track. Today, we are celebrating World Engineering Day. We're celebrating it virtually, and the theme for this year is Engineering Solutions for a Sustainable World, with the topic, Engineering for a Greener Tomorrow. As you may already know, engineers are the driving force behind progress, turning dreams into reality, and overcoming challenges with creativity and ingenuity. This celebration emphasizes the role of engineering as a career path and its capacity to positively impact the world. Particularly, there is a pressing need to focus on achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals in developing nations ensuring universal access to essentials like clean water, sanitation, reliable energy, all of which require engineering-related solutions. Now, for all of us, there is a shared responsibility to tackle challenges such as climate change, environmental issues, urbanization, and the evolving landscape of technologies like artificial intelligence. So World Engineering Day is not just a celebration. It is a recognition of the collective power of the engineering community to transform ideas into solutions, making the world a better place for current and future generations. Today, we honor the dedication and passion of engineers who work tirelessly to create a positive impact on society. So the theme of this year's World Engineering Day, Engineering Solutions for a Sustainable World, for sure resonates deeply. It emphasizes the critical role engineers play in finding, in finding sustainable solutions to environmental, social, and economic issues. It is a call to action for collaboration, innovation, and commitment to building a future where engineering is at the forefront of creating a harmonious balance between humanity and the planet. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you 
for joining us on this journey of celebration and reflection. Here's a shout out to the engineers who shape the world. Let us remind ourselves of the immense possibilities that lie ahead through the power of engineering. Thank you and let the webinar commence. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much to Tan Sri Mazlan for the speech. So ladies and gentlemen, before I pass the floor to our moderator, Prof. Dr. Nick Maria Nick Sulaiman, to take over, please allow me to introduce her. Prof. Dr. Nick Maria Nick Sulaiman acted as the Malaysian coordinator for the GSPS Asia Core project with Kyoto University, working on integrated watershed management for a five-year term. Her research interests have always been grounded in the environment and sustainability science, especially the participation of engineers for a sustainable future. She has dealt extensively in area pertaining to environmental management strategies, life cycle management, environmental education, sustainable process technologies, and air pollution, among others. Without further ado, I would like to invite Prof. Dr. Nick Maria Nick Sulaiman to moderate our session. So please welcome Dr. Okay. Thank you, Amira, for the introduction. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and greetings from sunny tropical Malaysia. Distinguished guests, fellow engineering enthusiasts from around the world, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to the World Engineering Day, a day when engineers all over the world are celebrated, appreciated for their contribution to a better planet. Today's event is dedicated to discussing critical issues in offering the engineering solution for a sustainable world with a particular focus on the challenges and opportunities presented by unique conditions in the tropical region. And I would like to stress tropical regions. I am most honored to be your moderator for today's session. Now, to set the stage, let's briefly look into the World Engineering Day theme, Engineering for a Sustainable World. Today, we gather to explore the profound connection between engineering and sustainability, delving into the crucial role ecosystems in the tropical region in sustaining life and fostering biodiversity. It is my hope, and not only my hope, everybody's hope, that our discussion will inspire collective action for the preservation and restoration of this vital ecosystem to take care of our planetary health. Right, let's move on. Our webinar today is divided into several segments, that is to ensure a comprehensive discussion of our theme. We will begin with panelists sharing their insights into the issues of the day. And following that, as usual, we will have an interactive Q&A session. And I hope everybody will join together um, to go ask questions to our expert panel. For housekeeping purposes, we would dive before we dive into discussion. Let's take a moment to go over the format and some guidelines for this webinar. As usual, the Q and A session afterward, we would like to encourage your active participation. Feel free to type your questions in the Q and A box. At any or chat box at any time, and we will do our best to address them during the Q and A session. Speakers may also type uh, their answers during, live during the whole program. Participants may use chat box to interact with fellow participants. This is a wonderful opportunity to connect with like-minded individuals who are passionate about engineering and what we can do to help the world come forward to a better um, sustainable environment. 
So let's move on. Today, we are privileged to have three distinguished experts, each contributing unique insights to our discussion. And we will start off with our first speaker. Our speaker uh, for uh, to open the whole webinar session would be uh, Insinyur T.S. Dr. Salmi Samsudin. I don't think I can do justice <laughs> to your CV. So a very short one, yeah, um, uh, Dr. Salmi? Yeah. Uh, you, can, you can go ahead <laughs> and also <laughs> come in as uh, necessary. A short bio of uh, Engineer Dr. Salmi. He is now the head of unit business development and commercial at TNB Fuel Services in Remember Hut. And for those who are not familiar with TNB, uh, this is a big giant electricity um, utility company in Malaysia, well known also in Asia and so on. And they are vertically integrated. They have many um, operations, especially with, uh, with the grid. Now, Dr. Sami is also an adjunct lecturer at University of Technology at Radas. His expertise includes thermal power operations, fuel combustion, performance, heat rate efficiency, anything you call about power production and, and the, the aspects of it. So, Following on, he also, he's also the has gone, uh, his experiences have gone beyond just you know, the part of the engineering is about project evaluation, uh, supply chain, and lean initiative and quality maintenance. He is a senior, uh, he has been um, the senior manager operation at TNB Janamanjo, which is one of the large uh, coal powered utility uh, power plant in Malaysia. And uh, without further ado, may I pass the floor to our first speaker. So, please. The web is yours, uh, Dr. Salmi. All right. Uh, thank you, Professor Dr. Nick Mariam, uh, for this uh, room. Uh, thank you for the organizer for inviting me. So basically, uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, I would like to elaborate a bit on the engineering for greener tomorrow. So this is my thought. I think this is refer to the applications of engineering principle and innovation, which is to address uh, the environmental challenges and promote the sustainability practices. So the greener tomorrow, which involves developing technologies, uh, including the solutions, which is to mitigate the climate change. So the most important is uh, what is engineers play a crucial role, how to meet uh, and, and uh, to achieve the ultimate goal uh, to ensure the sustainability of uh, renewable energy sources, uh, optimizing waste management and creating economic friendly infrastructure. So basically, uh, when we look at what is uh, green fuel in energy transition, uh, in Malaysia perspective, we are follow the recent launch by our government last year in August, National Energy Transition Roadmap, uh, which is NETR 2023. Uh, the first one was uh, highlight the six catalyst project, which is involved uh, with sustainability uh, project. And then there is a highlight, there is a six levers there, which is potentially will be involved by the industry and engineers in total. So looking at the green fuel in the context of energy transition, which is referred to the renewable and environmentally friendly, which is alternative to traditional fossil fuel, as mentioned by Professor Doctor, uh, from my past experience working uh, in TNB Janamanjung, is the largest coal power station supply 25% of the power generation to the peninsula Malaysia. We consume about 21,000 metric ton per day and gradually increase up to 40,000 per day uh, since 2018. So while, however, we, we have to take uh, into the challenge why we, we still rely to fossil fuel. Uh, 
the first challenges uh, you have to face it because the green fuel uh, is slightly uh, different uh, in terms of cost effectiveness. If you're looking at the market trend now, the fossil fuel compared to the LNG, uh, ammonia, hydrogen, biofuel, even the biomass, uh, fossil fuel is still the cheapest. Uh, it's a, currently, it's about 100 USD per metric ton, which is uh, our uh, Malaysia tariff electricity still at below par compared to the ASEAN region countries. And when looking at the why we still use uh, the why why what what is the challenges when we are facing go to the green fuel is the infrastructure. Uh, looking at the transition to green fuel requires substantial changes with the existing uh, infrastructure. Knowing the Malaysian policy for coal power station, it can be sustained until twenty five to thirty years power purchase agreement. Facing with that, if we want to change the power purchase agreement, it will take into account the uh, capacity and then the the, the suku and the financial, which, which is involved with uh, financial terms. Uh, so a dispute or interruption of modification to the uh, existing coal power station will be challenges to the power plant owner. It's not only TMB, but uh, including the IPP. Looking at the intermittency and storage of the fossil fuel and compare to the green fuel, renewable energy sources, which is often to the production of green fuel, can be intermittent. For example, uh, uh, we also conduct the first uh, supply chain to, to supply the biomass fuel to power, se power sector. Uh, from our market scaling, uh, we noticed that uh, the supplier readiness is not at the optimum uh, level. I would say because there is no incentive or approach from the government itself. And then the second thing is because the biomass fuel, uh, there is no preference index or basis pricing to, to put in uh, when we use this uh, as a transition fuel or green fuel to the power sector. Uh, looking at the another factors challenges, we 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 look at the technological technology maturity. Some green fuel technology are still in the early stage of development and may lack to the maturity and efficiency needed as wide adoptions, advancement in research and R and D, for example. And then we look at the policy and regulation regulatory framework. Uh, refer to the last year biomass action plans launched by government uh, in de December 2023. There is biomass action plan from 2022 up to 2030 only. But uh, in the uh, biomass action plan, they highlight the, the incentive or initiative, the program put in in the biomass action plan, which is to cater and to promote uh, all the industry, including energy sector, to apply the waste and the biomass uh, uh, waste. But we are in we are from the market and the industry still looking at the execution of the of the program initiative, the mechanism, the mechanism how we want to claim back from from the government. So uh, this is the most challenges to the power sector uh, face when we are. Uh, when, when we are looking for the green fuel. Uh, one more I would like to highlight, there is an economic as incentive, which is uh, if you compare uh, between Malaysia, Japan, and Korea, in Malaysia, uh, in Japan and Korea, they promote by introducing the feed-in tariff, which is the power sector who use the green fuel will have the, will claim, will have the opportunity to claim fit in premium. Fit in premium means the green fuel was used to generate the power, power, uh, the power, electricity uh, to to the regional area. So compared to the Malaysian government's Malaysian Malaysian policy, we don't have this type of incentive, which is most of the marketer or supplier reluctant to uh, contribute for this green fuel. Uh, 
one more thing I want to highlight also. What is the principle of to be, uh, sorry, what is the potential fuel as a green fuel we are looking for? In the MB fuel, we are the procurer company which is to supply all type of fuel including uh, for the power sector, including the uh, uh, TMB power station and IPP. We are a regulated company uh, which is non-profit motivated, uh, duty to purchase the fuel, all type of fuel for power generation uh, for TMB power station and IPP. So this is the mechanism uh, we want to highlight because all the fuel uh, cost is passed to the uh, people, to the rakyat, basically. So whatever cost we incurred for fuel, especially fossil fuel, green fuel, will pass, basically will pass to the to the rakyat, which is put in the tariff. So that's why the MBF is the dominant to procure all type of fuel, including the fossil fuel and green fuel to ensure the the tariff electric is at optimum level and still at low level compared to other countries. Uh, having said that, uh, looking at the current trending now, uh, uh, TMB itself, our parent company, also launched our net zero uh, sustainability pass, pass sustainability 2050, which is we want to achieve net zero by 2050. Uh, TMB, uh, in fact, uh, uh, commit uh, to reduce half of the coal power station by 2030, which is uh, most of our power uh, coal power plant will be uh, retired uh, uh, in 2030, which is uh, about 6,000 megawatt. So means we need to replace uh, this coal power station, this coal power plant, power generation with another type of fuel. So what is the alternative fuel, uh, potential fuel to be replaced for the coal? Looking at the potential fuel, now we study, uh, we observe there is LNG, is the most uh, reliable fuel uh, to replace the coal power station. But we have, please take note, because uh, there is no, not much gas or LNG in Malaysia anymore. We have to import from other countries as well. And then you know that LNG and gas price is most uh, higher compared to the fossil fuel. So in order to do that, we have to stagger, uh, reduce the and phase out the coal power station. Uh, in fact, from the uh, TMB sustainability pathway 2050, our last coal power station will be in 2045, which is 1,000 megawatt located in Jimah Energy Power, Negeri Sembilan. So, Doctor, uh, before I end my uh, 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 sharing, so basically, we I would I would like to highlight uh, now the MB fuel uh, subsidiaries of the MB still looking at the potential fuel. We also look at the biofuel, hydrogen, basically. Uh, synthetic fuels, uh, methane biogas, uh, green ammonia. Uh, in fact, uh, last February, we made a pilot, uh, our major milestone, we deliver uh, about 10,000 uh, biomass pellets to the non-power sector, which is our commitment uh, to show that we also uh, support the uh, uh, a nation, uh, national uh, inspiration by 2050 in reducing carbon. That's all from, from me, Dr. Professor. Okay, thank you very much, um, Dr. Salmi. You <clears throat> delve into, you know, what is the real uh, situation in the fuel industry with all its you know, challenges and so on. But I would like to be a half whole glass person. So as engineers, I think we should do something about it. We will discuss it later. I'm not here to actually you know, summarize what you're saying because I think in the interest of time, 
um, we would like to carry on with our second speaker. But anyway, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Salmi. So let's invite our second speaker, who is Engineer Al Khairi Muhammad Daud. And if I can read a short biography uh, of him, he is a principal consultant of Fakih Management and a professional mechanical engineer with more than 30 years experience that has spanned across many sectors, from gas process plant, oleochemicals to high-end um, R&D and even medical center facilities. He also He's also a member of the Institute of Asset Management in UK. And um, Insinyur al Khairi is not only a registered electrical um, energy manager, with Energy Commission, but has been appointed as the country expert, trainer, and auditor for EMAS, which stands for ASEAN Energy Management Standard under Green Technology Malaysia, and is preparing to be the expert trainer for ISO 5001. So his topic for sharing today is future engineer talent and skills for industries, which is a very uh, apt topic since we know we need more engineers. Let's see what Engineer Alkari would like to share with us. Over to you, yeah, sir. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Dr. Miriam. How are you? Gonna? you. Uh, I think I have some slides to show. Can I share my screen? Okay, and we can see my slide, uh, Prof. Yes, yes, we can see uh, your slide. Okay, again. So first, of all, so first of all, I thank you for the Academy of Science for inviting me to be a speaker this afternoon. You know, uh, when I was in many, uh, especially health center, healthcare centers, uh, healthcare facilities, uh, there always is a big uh, uh, on Nurses Day. The big celebration on Nurses Day. Somehow this year, I think it's the first time that I have ever uh, that we really celebrate on Engineers Day. Uh, the topic I have here is all about working about engineers. Uh, I will tell you about what is happening. Can before we say what the futures, what shall be the talent and skills for industries, we like to go back to what happens. Can what happens? Can before telling what is happening, I'm going to probably tell about my stories a bit more. So, kind of, before we say what's happening in the futures, we just have to reflect what is as about what is in the past. Because the past, the engineers has always been great. Again, it is not like now we are great. I think the, the past uh, engineers kind of, uh, technologies has been there. Uh, pyramids has been created for thousands of years. Kind of, you can see but, but all buildings, uh, remnants are still there. We have to look at the past to understand the future. Kind of. For me, I will just go back to a person kind of, as, a, as a, a professional engineer myself and to the guy who basically interview professional engineers kind of, regularly kind of, and also sit for with the boards of uh, PI boards for instance, engineers uh, as well as professional my set. Kind of. I interviewed many people for the last uh, probably the last 10 years or so kind of, that I interviewed many people uh, asking about simple things kind of, who is an engineer. Kind of. But the question that I ask basically, uh, the question I ask who is an engineer, it's always basically lingered uh, to my thoughts. Again. When I, after I graduating from UK uh, many years ago, again, again, over the 30, 30 years ago, again, uh, I have no clue what an engineer's profession is all about. Again. All that I know is I go there, study, got my degrees and work. Again. But one thing I'm very clear at that period of time is basically Kind of, and I also offered to be to, to go for both academics uh, sectors and I go for industrial sectors. Kind of. I'm very clear at that point, basically, I already decided to become a very good uh, engineer. Kind of. So that is my path that I took, uh, decided and so on. Kind of. As I go from uh, research facilities to uh, oil and gas, to oil chemicals, to petrochemicals, uh, to research facilities, to healthcare services. Kind of. And always to basically even go to the auditing now and checking all, all the hospitals and standards making. Uh, whenever I interview you know, uh, young engineers you know, or you know, and I interview uh, professional engineers to be a professional engineer, I ask who is an engineer. You know? It's a bit obvious. You know? People say basically uh, a doctor, they take care of patients. 
kan lah. Uh, a nurse basically dia take care of uh, apa uh, comes, apa uh, the treat patient the just doctor treat the patient the nurse take care of patient kan lah. Uh, lawyers basically take care of legal advances. Uh. But the question is basically prof lah. Uh, this is a question to you ah. Uh, kan lah. Uh, who is an engineer prof? Kan lah. Well, you want my answer now? Yes, 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 yes. Just be alternative. Uh, an engineer is the uh, a person that makes things happen. You know, when I became an, uh, you know, the, the three stages uh, in your life, you know, you collect information, you make it knowledge. And then what's the best thing about engineer is they make it happen. They don't have to wait for an ideal situation because it, something needs to be done, but you can improve it uh, along the way. So it's someone who makes things happen. Hopefully okay. for the right reason. <laughs> okay. I always basically but what all these contest people you know, when I say make it happen, everybody make things happen, you know. Everybody things happen. We will not define who's an engineer. You know. yeah. Because everything in lessons to do so basically you defining almost everybody you wanna. Know. They make things happen, you know. Again, uh but artists they make things happen, you know. they create something wrong. But who's an engineer? This is my always basically one of the highlight since we are celebrating engineers. Before we say what's happening in the futures, I would like to say I'm defining what is the, who is an engineer. Kind of. This is my definition, kind of, in which basically it, it, it explains a lot. Kind of. After many years of seeing many things, kind of, I'm defining an engineer. Kind of. An engineer is a professional kind of, who, as simple as solving problems, kind of, kind of. again, a person who solves problems, they are engineers. Kind of. But I always say basically solving problem is one thing. Right? Everybody solve problems. Again, we must do something a bit more different. Right? Because a doctor solve problems, a lawyer solve problems. Again, we cannot just say we just solve problems. We have a different in the way that we solve problems. We solve problems systematically. And engineers will always be systematized in the way that we think. That's why we say we will say right brain and left brains. If you are procedural, you left brains. You are engineering minds. If you are right brains, basically you are artistic values. Basically, kind of you are in the right brains. Right? You you think beyond. You are not so structured in your thinking. Right? So an engineer must solve problem in a way of systematic thinking. Right? But that also not explaining a lot. Right? We cannot do that right? because many people solve problems. Many people solve problems systematically. But there's one thing that nobody else do which is using physical laws. Kind of. Nobody else, kind of, other than engineers using physics laws. Kind of. Lawyers never use physics laws. Doctors never use physics laws. Kind of. They use about biological, etc. Kind of. Doctors solve symptomatically. Engineers solve systematically. Kind of. That defines who we are. Because if you're thinking systematically, solving problems continuously using physical laws, then you are engineers. That is my definition. This is a skill set that you must have. Kan? This is the thing that we've been taught, the fundamental aspects that we have taught engineers kan? from the fundamental towards to the lifelong. Kan? So I would like, like to go a bit more deeper kan? in all the three skill sets that we must have. Kan? The first one is basically about solving problems. Kan? Again, oh, Prof, eh? Again, Prof eh? you say you solve problems, kan? you make things happen. Why you take make, make things happen? You must solve a problem. If you're not a problem, because you can make things happen, but you can still create a problem. <laughs> so the key difference is we solve problems. We don't talk about politics, kind of. we don't talk about what people like. We solve problems. What problem we solve? Kind of. As our good Albert Einstein says, basically, a, a problem kind of, can, cannot, cannot be a symptom level that we created them. Kind of. So we have to be in higher domains, kind of, higher domains. When we talk about green now, it is just not about doing or solving the problems. Kind of. Solving the issues, we have to go on a bigger, deeper stage, kind of, in the higher stage, yeah, looking into the entirety of the system. This is what I'm going to deal a bit more. Kind of. The question I will ask is basically solving problem. Sometimes basically, uh, we must always ask, yeah, what is a problem? <laughs> what is the problem? Uh, pro kind of? What is the problem? I will answer later. I will let you. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Nah. I will let you go on to the thing first. Okay. Okay. So problem again. Okay, so people always say problem again. Yeah. This is a problem. Sometimes people do not understand what actually they say again. Okay. 
Kan? I define a problem is basically a deviation from expected outcomes. If you are have a deviation from the expected outcome, you have a problem. If you are expecting the outcomes and the outcome is like you have, you ha you don't have a problem. The question that we have now, in terms, let's say, for in terms of energy, for example, what are we expecting? What can are we expecting to do something and we can do with something about it? Then it becomes a problem. Let's because let's look at that. the problem always lies. What I say in this entire world, Ghana, is by defining a problem. What is a problem and what is not a problem? What is an issue and what is not an issue, Ghana? Having to change the energy source, etc., uh, what we have, is it a problem or not a problem? We think it is a finite, Ghana. But energy cannot be created, no, it's what you have to change form. Ghana. We, when we talk about abundance in, the, in terms of energy, we say that basically it's not a problem. It is basically the source is a problem. Again, because we think it's a finite one. The, the gas is basically a finite one. But energy is not finite one. We were going to find ways of solving the problems. Again. So the issue is problems. Again. With the problem, again, we have a lot of solutions. Again. Knowing the problem is not something that we should be black on. The question is about solutions. Again. And there are multiple solutions that we are talking about. Again. So engineers must find what is the most economical solution? Uh, what is the most workable solution? Uh, many people can talk about problems. Not many people can talk about solutions. Uh, many people can have ideas uh, how to solve problems. Uh, but not many people are able to uh, materialize it. Uh, people can talk about solutions. Uh, but can that be materialized? Uh, and this is the key principles. Uh, this is the key uh, notable uh, uh, roles of engineers. Uh, we must identify the problems. We must identify what are the issues, Ghana, and we must provide what is a workable solution. Ghana. The solutions may not be perfect solution, but a solution is basically the one that's workable within our means now. Ghana. So the first skills that we must have is solving problems, Ghana. identifying your problem. Ghana. The question that we always say is a problem is basically we're always asking a why. Ghana. It's always a why. We can root cause analysis and so on. Ghana. It's always like a why. Why we do, do, do this? Ghana? This is what as engineers, I think. I think as engineers goes into a, a, a much senior seniority, they tend to forget the basics, the questions, the, 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 the inquiry, inquisitive minds of engineers. Can. That's what engineers is all about. Can. It's always, always asking the why. Why should we always be the issues? And as I, saw, I, I see many, many times, basically, in industries, well, many young engineers, basically, again, oh, they just come out, graduate from schools, they will not ask the why. They will just ask, do what is expected them to do. As engineers, the word ingenuity comes in. It means, okay, you must find noble solutions. Again. Knowing the why are you doing it. Knowing the why are you giving the solutions. Knowing the why are you embarking on certain activities. Those are basically a key pre requirement for engineers. Kind of. You must be intuitive. Right? You must always question the status quo. Right? Otherwise, basically, we will not progress. We will never pursue our uh, improvements, uh, technologies, and new, new frontiers. Right? There's always somebody must ask you why. This must always be inquisitive mind who always challenge the current status. Right? So we need to understand that is basically the key elements. Can one of the most important aspect is solving the problems. Can knowing what is the problem is the first one, and then know what shall be the solutions. Can where you get the solution. Can the problems now, as I see, people go to AIs. Can can there are things with the AI. Can people for me, can uh, it is basically AI will not replace our inquisitive minds. Can our minds are much more greater than that. Can so we must reach again, the young engineers, the future engineers, be able to think critically. Again. Think again, what is their problem again, and not just adopting what is being given to them. Again. Now it's the AI is giving us all those issues. Again. We need to start again, having the, this mind as an engineer's mind. The, the next skills uh, we, I'm also thinking is it's about systematically. Again. The good thing, uh, Prof, again, is basically again, uh, I work in process plan. As a process plan, I always basically for half of my life I work in a process plan. I work in many process plan. The first thing that I, they teach me is basically is understanding the process, understanding the process, understanding the process. Can I? I'm a mechanical genius, but I I ninety percent chemical genius. Can I? Because I understand the process 
fully even. Because that is the most important aspect. Sir. It's understanding the process. This is I call system system thinking. It's how we do think, how we think. Can it should not be just solving a problem, just looking into the microscopic of that event. We have to look into the bigger pictures. Not only the fuel, but we have to go to the higher aspect. Sir. We have to look into the whole uh, aspects of the components. Sir. So I I look basically there's a there's a there's a teaching which I don't want to elaborate because. There's a process steps here, yeah, in which basically we have to look into how we resolve things. You know, you know. They are, we call it system thinking. You know. So everything that we do, you, know, you must have system. I always basically go back to basics. You know. Make life easier is always go back to basics. You know. we, we, uh, system thinking is the one that we, we teach about mathematics. You know. Engineers must learn about mathematics. You know. In mathematics, it's about the steps that we solve the problems. They are always we follow, must follow the steps. The reason that we follow the step is we can trace back where we fall, where we made errors, and we can redo it again. So we must have thinking. But that is in school. In life, the problems are not defined. That is the issue. The problems are not defined. We as engineers have to define the problem and look what shall be the issues. We have to look at the systematic, in which basically we have to go beyond. Again, looking at the last one, the forest thinking. We are not looking at the trees alone. We are looking at the forest. What shall be the impact of the environment? What shall be the impact of the safety aspects? Sir? What shall be the impact for our future generation of the for sustainability of the atom? We have to go beyond what is the obvious. We have to go beyond what is basically prescribed to us. This is the idea that we are talking about. Again. We have also the operational thinking, the close thinking, and the scientific thoughts. Again. So these are I call it systematic thinking that we all must have. Engineers and teachers must be taught to go beyond what is just written on the papers. It is have to go beyond what's happening and, and shall be what shall be the impact of your activities. Gonna. And eventually look at that when it's all about communicate and understanding. These are also the issues that I feel and engineers have concern. Gonna. It is basically how to communicate properly, how to communicate your thoughts again how to communicate especially to non-engineers again how can we influence them how can we convince them how can we dictate again, the financial sectors and how to move again the, the business into our economic again, into a technological economy the driver is always engineers again because they provide the solution again. not again, the financial guy again, who dictates what shall we do i think this is basically important to have a systematic thinking the third one, elements that was always says basically is I call it a, I call it a, uh, physical source gun. This is basically aspects that any genius will learn gun. These are basically physics gun. Physical laws are not only just pure physics yeah. Physics I always call it a, as a laws gun. You call it Newton's law. You can all the all the laws can come to you know, uh, per, uh, per the thermodynamics laws etc. These are laws gun. Engineers must be well versed gun. The laws gun. You must really understand the laws gun because. It is not physics laws. It is God's law. God has created the laws. We, again, the humble humans, again, are just observing the events, again, the activities, and then we postulate and say it is a law. Again, if we start to understand the laws and the impact of the laws, again, we shall be able to progress further and understand the way that should be done. I think that's the issue. Again. On top of that physics laws, again, we must understand it's all about, we must also understand all the human laws. You know? That basically is created by X and regulation. You know? This is the engineers must always ask again, what should be the regulatory requirement? What should be the performance that the, the government's requirement of the data? Well, what should be the standards of the industries that comes in? So this is the thing that we must come into place. You know? And engineers must always understand what shall be the, the influence, the decisions be making, the standards and so on, what she comes in. Because we can't, cannot be thinking everything. We cannot be searching everything. We have to follow some standards. We have to follow what shall become seen. Again, but engineers may, must not always think complying to a standard all the time. Again. We must always challenge, is the standard relevant and so on. Because standards are basically, it's just basically what we return. For example, can, uh, what shall be uh, impacts to the environment, can, uh, the, the, the ozone depletions, etc., the one that we uh, emit to the, uh, uh, or the refrigerants that we emit to the, the environment, those basically have changed economy. So yes, we can understand the standards, but can we improve it further? That's the question. The next one, basically, I uh, saw so laws as well, it's all about code of practice. Can. It's all about ethical issues. Can. We must have 
engineers must always understand the ethical issues that must be uh, uh, governing the way that we do things. Kana. Yes, it's always a challenge here between what is the real laws, kana, the God's law, and what is the laws of the, of the land. And again, basically, what shall be your conscience? Kana. Your conscience to go, what shall be? Kana. This is a skill. Kana. You must work on the conscience, kana. the conscience effort. Engineers should not slip kana, on the past knowledge and experience. Must always endeavor to look into what shall be the future kana, issues and so on. Will, and then the questions of ethics will always come in. We always come in. Where it comes in. Putting all these things in wraps, kana, we must align everything into harmonious ways. Because God has created the world kana, into a, 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 a environmental violence. Kana. Everything is harmonious ways. Kana. God has created a perfect design. We, the humans, are the one that change the laws. Kana. We manipulate the law so much, kana, but we can try to damage the environment that we have. Kana. We think about profit so much now, kana, forgetting about the future uh, generation. Kana. That was the issue. So now, kana, we must put, kana, the engineers must understand these laws. Kana. For you to solve our problems, for you to be systematized in the way that you do things, kana, the fundamentals that differ to any other professions is the physics laws. Kana. And this basically is the key def definitions for me for, for engineers. Kana. Kana. So now, kana, what shall be the future engineers? What shall be the future engineers look like? Kana? The future engineers basically for me have two things. Kana. First, you have to work with nature. Kana. You must understand what the natural is all about. Kana. We are just like solving problems. We are just like what, a jigsaw puzzles. Kana. We must look into what shall be what is our environment so We must understand what God has given to us and we understanding what is the physics of the atoms and then we can make use of all the environments, what the things, the resources available to us to our benefits. Kana. We have to be systematic in the way that we do things. Kana. Engineers must be systematized kana, because we, sometimes we do a lot of trial and errors. Kana. We must have systemic approach in we do things. Kana. With that, kana, prof, kana, we can provide solutions. Kana. The engineers of the futures can even now can with this concept, these skill sets can they will think properly you know, holistically you know, they will provide solution for the betterment of the of the world. You know. This shall be the green impact, you know. this shall be the sustainability aspect, you know. this shall be the efficiency aspect, you know. this shall be the, the go something beyond what it has just been taught, you know, that you just have a simple problem to you know. but we can. You know, all of us collectively will be able to solve a bigger problem kana, to the world. Kana. With that, I say thank you very much. Kana. Thank you, uh, Engineer Alkairi. You started off with the basic question of who is an engineer and then went on to give us your um, whole comprehensive definition of, what an, of who an engineer is. And, and I think we thank you very much for all your inside and we will wait questions from the floor later on um, you know things that pertain to the human talents and skills for industries we have to move on to our final speaker who is ready and he is no other than um dr khalid muhammad sabil and dr khalid muhammad sabil is a seasoned professional with engineering and a seasoned professional with 20 years plus of expertise in chemical petroleum engineering, reservoir engineering, and gas sustainability. He has a PhD uh, specializing in thermodynamics. We heard just now, this is a physical law, you know, thermodynamics. Everything can be done if you know your thermodynamics well. Currently, he is the senior manager of Petronas uh, Research in the Rambert has notable patents in gas suppression technology. Dr. Khalik is dedicated to advancing technology for an equitable energy transition. And as an academic leader, he has contributed significantly to curriculum development and student growth, fostering innovation through dynamic learning environment. His topic for sharing today is green skills in oil and gas industries. So over to you, uh, Dr. Khalik. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Dr. Nick, uh, and also the organizer for the invitation. 
So it's always difficult to be the first, uh, the third speaker for any sessions, because obviously from IR Salmi and also IR Kairi, I think there's a lot of good points. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to continue. Hopefully, I'll bring a, a different insights for the sessions that I'm having, and also kind of like trying to patch together the informations to basically what I'm going to share. Yeah, especially you know, the green skill required for not necessarily just oil and gas industry, but energy industry. I'm also having some slide to share. So just give me a, a second. Yeah. So can you guys uh, see my slides? Yes, you can maximize it, I think. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So first and foremost, I think I really like uh, what Prof. Kyrie mentioned just now, the why, right? So even like before I accepting these particular invites, yeah, so when I get the invitation, I was asking why? Why should I participate in this, right? And looking at its World Engineering Day and it's also focusing on energy for sustainable growth. And of course, uh, we talk about engineering for the green, uh, you know, solutions. So I thought like, yes, this is very, first and foremost, I'm working with Petronas. This is very much tied into Petronas' statement of purpose. Yeah, For those of you, you who, do, uh, who doesn't know what Petronas' statement of purpose is, mm -hmm. it is as a progressive energy and solution partner and reaching life for a sustainable future. So even from that particular statement of purpose, even a giant like Petronas, nowadays we are not just talking about oil and gas. Yeah, we are talking about energy. So the world is changing. So that's why if you see my slide, I purposely cancelled. That's not a mistake. I'll just want to make it as a highlight. So we are talking about gr uh, green skill in energy industry, not no longer about oil and gas, right? So that's important. And again, we are asking us, right? What I'm going to talk about today yeah, what what are the skills? Why? I mean, is it not the same like 30, 40 years ago or a decade ago? What's changed? So we'll go for the next slide. And I think this is a very a very familiar concept. Either, either we accept the theory, it's not, it's not the, the point here. But what you see from this particular diagram is the process of evolution, which is basically about change, right? And even, um, you know, a philosopher from Greece, yeah, Heraclitus, mentioned it to us. Change is the only constant in life. So in order for us to progress, we cannot stay static. We have to change. And even as, you know, the professionals working in engineering sector, especially in energy sector, if we are not going to change, we just use the practices that we used 30, 40 years ago. We are not going to provide the solution required in present day and also for the future. Because I think that's why I really like to try back tie in into what has been discussed by my esteemed colleagues just now, IR Kairi. I mean, you know, I mean, in order for us, for engineers to provide the the best solution possible with all the governing laws that are being shown just now, we need to understand why. What is the needs, right? So the needs that you probably have 50, 60 years ago are very much different than nowadays. So let me take an example. In oil and gas industry per se, what's changed? Yeah. So if you take a look at these uh, particular diagrams that I'm sharing over here in the early days, if you look into the operation, it's onshore. Yeah, a simple, you know, in, in, in early days, is even simpler than that. It's a donkey kind of uh, arrangement. If you see on my third slide, you see kind of like a, what we call as a donkey. It's so basically, on, it's just a pump that you can just simply pump. Yeah, I mean, you drill the well, for example, and onshore, and then you pump and the, the oil coming out easily. Yeah, and the tools that you probably need during the early days are nothing more than pencil and papers. And some people say it's just kind of a bow and arrow. So you just shoot somewhere where the bow actually will 
touch the land and you drill and you probably produce the oil. That's how easy it was. Yeah. Of course, there are some understanding about the sciences, geosciences, petroleum engineering, reservoir engineering is required, but it was easy. And the, the, the game was basically to produce oil that you actually can supply. So the very little, uh, for example, concern about the environment, very little concern in terms of the value change. You use available technologies yeah, from uh, automotive industry or even from refinery, I mean, a refining industry that you have just now uh, during that time because that's the knowledge that you have. Yeah? But those are early days in the 1920s, 1930s. And then if you go to most what people call as the golden age of uh, hydrocarbon industry, the 70s up to the 90s, yeah? What's changed? First and foremost, yeah, the world change, the economic growth change, yeah, the needs of fuels increase tremendously, right? So you, I mean, and even in the 70s, you have an energy crisis, yes? I mean, you, you can see the photo over there. Sorry, no guess. So you have to ramp up production in order for you to meet with the customer demands. So is it enough for you to just have operation on shore? This is the time when people thinking like, no, it's not enough. We have to go to offshore. We started to have offshore uh, platform, for example, in the North Sea. You start operation yeah, in the North Sea in the 1970s, 1974, if I'm not mistaken. You, you started to do that. And the thing is, if you move any operation from onshore to offshore, if you just stay static and you use just the knowledge that you have, you're not going to be, you know, uh, to be successful, yeah? Because the environment is different. Now you have to do drilling uh, offshore. I mean, a uh, bodies of water on top, for example. You have to do cementing in an environment full of water, for example. And then you have to do perforation and production at a very high pressure inside the reservoir. So if you don't maintain that, I mean, in, in order for you, instead of you having a continuous production, you're probably creating a, a disaster, yeah? Because you, you, you probably have a blow up, meaning that you have a uncontrolled oil spill. So you have to change. You have to adapt. Yeah, I really like the point when, you know, you have to use the physical laws, yeah, that you know in terms of engineering, in terms of physics, mm -hmm. in terms of chemistry to ensure safe operation, yeah? And that is in terms of the knowledge. And then in the late, in, in the early 80s, late 90s, you started to adopt computers, yeah? And in uh, oil and gas industry, that's, I do believe, is actually quite a, an important, uh, how do you say, it, um, addition into the tools that we can use in order for us to have a very uh, basically productive uh, evaluation of the reservoir, appraisal of it. And actually, it helps us for designing yeah, the whole operations to make it very profitable, right? So now, if you and engineers that very successful in the 50s, for example, and you really don't want to adapt to computers, yeah, you will be left behind, yeah. But again, during that times, the main idea for you is still to ensure the supply change of hydrocarbons, either it's oil or gas, to the consumer is adequate, right? So you are still talking about profit with a very little concern, if I may say it, in terms of the environmental impacts, yeah? Less concern in terms of sustainability, less concern about the climate change, yeah? Because those are not being talked a lot during those periods, yeah, in the 70s and 90s. So now we move another 20, 30 years to the present and potentially in, uh, in the future. What's changed? We have a better computer, great, yeah? However, the number of reservoirs that you can easily produce becoming less and less, yeah? And you have to go to deeper water. You have to develop in brown field or very marginal field, very small productions. So if you're going to have a very big 
offshore facilities is not going to be economics. Yeah? Economy is becoming a major factor. So in terms of the engineering and technologies, there's a lot of changes that you need to adapt and improve compared to the technologies and know-how that you use in the 70s and 90s. So there is an evolution in terms of that technologies. I think quite a number of us over here in one way or another is doing a lot of different R&D activities that fit into the whole value change of oil and gas industry. Yeah? Oil and gas industry is not necessarily just stop after you do, you found the, re, I mean, the reservoir, you explore and you produce it. Yeah. Then there is also a mid-term industry where you have to transport yeah, the oil and gas into refinery. You process it and from refinery products, especially uh, the gas. Yeah. So you actually develop the whole petrochemical industry. I mean, basically everything that you use nowadays from your cloth to your you know utilities and others are actually a products from oil and gas industry so huge value change over there yeah which probably not much being talked about in the early days or even in the 1970s uh, but nowadays that's the whole value change so there's a lot of integration between upstream midstream and downstream processes so nowadays, even if you want to do the economic itself, it's not just about exploration any, anymore. You have to have the whole value change. So the scope of works is bigger. So of course, I mean, the adaptation of the, I mean, uh, of computers is very much uh, needed. Yeah, for example, uh, in the industry nowadays, let alone in the future. On top of those technology advancement, Nowadays, you have a lot more challenge. Yeah, if you see over there yeah, on my slide, the first thing you see, just stop oil. You have a lot of resistance from a general public about oil and gas industry. Yeah? I mean, in, in a way, maybe it's good to, to, to painting a very negative pictures about oil and gas industry, but is it really so? If you know the physics, you know the, the, the sciences behind it, probably you have a slightly different aspect of it, the different understanding of it. Yeah. And if you remember our first speaker talking about energy transition, just ask yourself, without oil and gas industry or even without fossil fuel, can we have a just and equitable energy transition? Can we just immediately stop? the use of oil, gas, and even uh, coal, for example, and but then maintaining our way of life today. Yeah? Is it possible? I don't think so. Even in the next 50 years, oil and gas, including uh, coal, fossil fuels, still plays a significant role. With all the advancement in renewables energy, for example, yeah, I mean, it's probably going to contribute about 20 to 30 percent yeah you gas will be have a very significant uh, percentage as uh, as the type of energy to be consumed in the future yeah still about 40 50 percent and the rest is uh coal and also oil so what can we do yeah in terms of trying to balance out the energy demand the expectation uh, expectation of the publics and also to meet with rules and regulations yeah again as mentioned by uh prof i mean i are kairi just now i mean when we are dealing in engineering world there is a code of conduct there's ethics yeah there are sciences that we have to uh govern uh with yeah so you have to follow those so the idea over here what i'm trying to mention to you like the challenges that you face today and in the future is significantly different from the early days yeah so in the early days if you don't have advanced knowledge probably that's okay yeah because you know i mean whatever you have in the books you can just follow you can produce yeah but as the world move now you need to integrate the knowledge that you have not just the sciences you also have to Knowledge about human uh, factors, for example, HR subjects are becoming important, for example. You need to know your economics, yeah? And so there's a lot of, and again, the, the use of digitalization tools, robotics, 
will probably improve your production, which probably, you know, in some cases, yeah, if you're working offshore sometimes, probably is better for safety, yeah, HAC. I mean, in some of the field where you have a very high H2S, for example, if you're going to send people over there, they are prone, yeah, to, to the exposure to toxic gases, for example. Can we use robots? To, to produce from those wells where the contaminants can be immediately sent back to storage. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I mean in, the, in the same location, whereas then you just extract the usable uh, hydrocarbons, for example. So those are a different aspects. And again, in, in the future itself, can we integrate renewable energy, for example, for you to, to have production in the offshore platform? Can we tap into solar? We Can we tap into wave energy or wind energy so that the operation of hydrocarbon becoming uh, less uh, polluting in terms of the emission of CO2? Yeah, I mean, those are the integrated kind of technologies potentially you need to consider moving to the future. So, what type of green skill that's probably required for the future engineer, engineers in energy industry? Basically, I mean, I just categorize it into five different category. And I just want to mention to you, I mean, how do I come out with this category? It's, just, it's not just the work of my, mine alone. Yeah. So recently, we, last week, we have uh, Offshore Technology uh, Conference Asia, OTCA 2024. So I'm privileged enough to work with a group of final year student, engineering student from, uh, from all around the globe, from Kurdistan, from Nigeria, Malaysia, and India. And they go and talk to, how do you say it, all the industry leaders and asking about this particular question. Yeah, What kind of skill required by future in engineers. Yeah? So in a way, if you look into the five different categories, it's not so much different from what has been uh, shared by my panel's uh, members just now. Yeah, Again, you have to have a strong technical background, meaning that, you know, or you have to have a sound grasp of your physical laws just now, your code of conduct and so on and so forth. Because you are not just going to solve a problem for that particular moment. Now you have to think the consequences of the problem problems that you uh, propose to generation to come, right? So you have to have all of those being shared by IR Kairi just now in place for you to have a strong technical background. And again, be mentioned by Prof. Nick. Yeah, nowadays, SDG, sustainability is becoming very important. So whatever that we do, as a responsible engineers, you need to have sustainability mindset. Yeah, whatever that you do, you have to think what is the impact to human, to the environment, and to basically to, to nature itself. Yeah, diversity and inclusion. We use... We are so used to be divided. You are mechanical engineers. You are chemical engineers. You are electrical engineers. It's not no longer relevant. Yeah. In order for you to find the best solution, you always have to work in a team. And the team doesn't have to consist only with engineers. Now, data scientists, physicists, yeah, chemists, even HR personnel or economics. Economists has to work together. But what is your role as engineer is the one that's probably having the best aspect and know-how for you know to to provide the the equitable solution for the problems that you have. Yeah. So you probably can take a role to lead a diverse team so that you can have I mean the information from different angles to provide the best solution for any problems that you that, that you have. Yeah. Technology and adaptations, yeah. Being an engineer for the futures, you can't run away by utilizing the technology. Yeah. I really like the point by uh I, I Kyrie. The AI, for example, not going to replace you. You need to use them to your advantage to, to provide the solutions. That's the key. So you have to work hand in hand with technology, but do not lead, 
the artificial intelligence to lead the way. You still need to lead the way. Yeah, you just use them as a tool. And last but not least, and I think this is when the world, I mean, especially the academic world, has to play a very big role. We have to instill the sense of purpose among our new graduates. Yeah, we're going to go into engineering field, not just because okay, I'm capable of being an engineer. I do engineering probably during my time. Yeah, that was the sense. Okay. Okay, chemical engineering sounds glamorous, so I'll just do it. No, yeah, I mean, with all the information that you have nowadays, we have to create this. We have to scuff holding the graduates, especially undergraduates, so that they have the sense of purpose. They have a strong technical background. They can use technology and adapt it, yeah? And work, teamwork is very, very important because Every time when I was still in academics, you know, the accreditation bodies come, they're always asking about student works and teamwork, so on and so forth. So that is key. yeah. And last but not least, the sustainability has to be inculcated in the minds of engineers for the future. I think I will stop there. I think I finished my time. Yeah? Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Dr. Khaled. Thank you, Dr. I think um we have to say I am gonna gonna unmute now. Yeah, everybody can hear. Thank you very much for all the speakers who has shared with us with passion on um engineering today. Uh, now it is time for Q and A. We have about maybe forty to forty five minutes before we wrap up the whole thing for the day. Uh, in the meantime, uh, participant, please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box and we'll discuss as many as we can during this uh, session. Are there questions already from that? Yeah, but I'm going to be a bit selfish. I'm going to start first because I think uh, Engineer Khairi has started because by asking me who is an engineer. Now, my, my question is, now becomes who is a wholesome engineer? We have talked about, you know, engineering, uh, looking, we expanded the horizon of an engineer, not just the, on the technicalities, but it's about beyond profits. But what I don't see yet coming up is the circularity in the definition of an engineer. Uh, you know, why uh, engineer, uh, Dr. Khalid was having all those five sets and that uh, I, I don't see it yet being combined in the circular, whereas circular economy is a big thing now and so on. Where is the security? But I would like to unpackage it to all the um panelists uh, in the sense of the different cohorts that you talk when you are engineer. What are you looking for uh, on a reality check basis for three phases? Orang yang baru masuk, you know, people who are uh, youngsters who are looking for STEM education in engineering, those who are already in the middle management, and the one in the C suite, do do should how, how should they be upskilling themselves? I, I know this can take more than a few minutes to talk about, but maybe share your thoughts about you know the unpackaging of a wholesome engineer with circular thinking on top of the system system thinking at different phases of their life so because no uh, you can't get all this all at once so unpackaging into the three different cohorts anybody can have a go maybe engineer khairi go dulu ah oh, let me let, let me answer that yeah, thank you i asked that question to the engineer because it's engineers day then and many times i ask many engineers you know, they cannot even answer me who's the engineers you know? And some of them say uh, they are just to whatever they need to do. Uh. But I think uh, as a young engineer, uh, we are always basically governed by our boards. Uh, we govern by our professions. Uh, so the, the first things I always say is, uh, again, talking about circular economies as uh, well, comes in, uh, that everything must go back to nature. Uh. You, 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 uh, first one for, for any engineers, the first thing you have to do is you, you have to uh, be on your own. So. So be inquisitive, you know, learn your, the first basic is your, your basic skills. You know, you know, if you're chemical engineers, yeah, you work on your understanding the physics of it. Because don't, not understanding the physics 
uh, the engineering physics, you, know? you will not be an engineer. So. You will be other people, like you can be technicians, etc. But you will not be able to answer that. The first one you have to do is understand the physics. Because the physics is the law, and the God created you know, uh, gravity, with the falls, the subordinate equations, can they are the reactions, the actions, everything we well. First one is always learn the basics, you know. Learn the physics, uh, master your physics in the first few years of life, you know. No, uh, but connecting the dots is not easy. You know. In my experience, it takes me about 10 years uh, to, to be able to understand the, the dots. You know. The next one is basically don't restrict yourself ourselves into uh, 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 into our own disciplines. We have to be diverse in all our disciplines. Now, kind of, it's no such thing that I'm mechanical engineer. So I will not be uh, good enough or, or able to talk uh, to governments, kind of, to dictate, kind of, if I just understand my mechanical system. Everything is very complicated now. Kind of. Everything is available. Kind of. We must be uh, highly interactive. Kind of. We have multidisciplinary uh, ideas. Kind of. So first, understand your, your basics. Yeah. Second, you must expand your knowledge to be beyond physics. You, know. yeah, you must go now, the first uh, engineering aspect, now you have to go for all other aspects, yeah, to economics, to finance, to HR, to everything. Yeah. You must be able to talk to those elements. Yeah. Yeah. As you go on, yeah, you, the, after probably 10, 20 years or so, yeah, you will start to realize yeah, that everything will fall in places. Yeah. Things make sense. Yeah. I find basically physics are uh, much more simpler compared to what I did my A levels last time. Kind of. so now physics is kind of mm, it, it just makes sense, kind of. Kind of. Last time it doesn't make sense at all, kind of. So the last one, kind of, come to circularity is like it is the duty again for senior engineers kind of, to nurture back the young engineers. Kind of. I was fortunate when I was in LNG last time, kind of, kind of, uh, I was trained properly. You know. I was asked to do the tension job or the job etc. Always for me, kind of, you must do the the, the, the jobs, kind of. hence must ability, kind of, really touch on the the actual physical aspects for you to understand. Now people I think they're relying too much of YouTube, TikToks, or virtual worlds, kind of. But we, as I said, it's a physical also, kind of, physics. Huh? We we have to touch, we have to feel, we have to understand, kind of, because we are living in the real world, kind of. So in the end, kind of, after you do that, kind of, you must come back and nurture the young engineers back, kind of. To make a circular. So a good engineer, a senior engineer must always basically build build more better engineers than them. Can okay? develop them further. Okay? That will create a scalability. Okay? Solve problems. Okay? Again, basically, always solve problems. Okay? The idea is solving problems. Okay? Challenge the, 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 the solution that we have. Okay? And with that, basically, I think we will be making up our young engineers. Okay? So I think that's a very key element I say we have to work on in the face of life. Okay? Understanding from where we start. Our fundamentals to beyond our our fundamentals, kind of to our part associated uh, knowledge, can and then eventually we have to go back to to rebuild the young generations can, to understand engineers and engineering is all about can, and provide again solution in a much more uh, 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 cohesive and uh, holistic manner. Can, uh, when we understand this happen, can. that's that's my take. So. Uh, thank you, engineer Khairi. Uh, I think there is a question um chat, is it? Oh. Coming in from the participant, oh. which is also in connection with the talent and skills. But more specific, uh, if I can read it out, how to prepare junior engineers to suit a challenging um workforce and what the industry seeks from them, the two-way process. Just now I was asking a question for the three different cohorts. Young, uh, you know, those coming on board, those who are already in the middle management, how they can upscale, yeah. and those who are C-suite people who who makes, you know, the top down decisions that have to go back and forth. But this particular question also sort of touches in the fringes of the uh, question that we are talking about. But in particular to the junior engineers, what should they, um, how to prepare them for yeah. junior engineers who so is the middle level? And then, what do industries um expect from them? Maybe uh Dr. Khalid uh, about preparation and uh Dr. Salmi about what industries uh you do expect from them. Although this is just this is more beyond your grade field, uh, but it's also about human development. Yes, um, uh, thank you for that, uh, Prof. And I think that's a very good question. In a way, it touches your question too. I mean, let's learn it from another profession, yeah? If you're being a medical doctor, 
yeah, you just graduated with medical degree. For you to be a licensed practitioner, what do they do? They rotate, right? They rotate the job functions. I mean, I mean, you may start e I mean, I mean, emergency, for example. Then you go for a different, different, you know, I mean, related fields that where their job as a doctor is needed. We don't do that in engineering. There is a potential in engineering. If I started day one and working, looking at one unit operation until the day I retired, that's the only thing I know. So you're talking about integrated kind of a solution. You want to create a person with an integrated knowledge. But if that opportunity never be given, how can you develop that? That's the first question. Similarly, prior for them to go becoming an engineer, engineers, look at the education itself. You know, again, over here, we're always treated, okay, chemical engineering, you are a cohort of chemical engineering students. Even if there is a teamwork, team project, you work as a team project in chemical engineering no domain. You never actually most probably not being exposed to the other part of engineering. Yeah, even from undergraduate study, why can't we, for all first-year engineering graduates, give them one topic, very high level, work as a team, regardless you are civil, electrical, mechanical, whatever, dump into a project because they have to find solution. This is when you are going to create an integrated type of person that probably... Okay, my expertise in one particular area, but I know all the issues and I probably get the connection. Where can I find the solution if I'm required to? I think that's that's something missing in terms of the way that we kind of like teaching. Yeah. And also giving, uh, how do you say, training to our juniors uh, in, uh, in engineering fields. I note, yeah, I mean, in uh, big companies, I mean, I have to take an example for Petronas, for example. Yes, you have continuous development programs. Yeah, you have assessment, for example, for you to go from a junior engineers to becoming a staff engineers, you need to, uh, what we call is SKG group. Probably I Kairi is actually well aware of that. There's a lot of domains where you have to basically develop your uh, technical skill and being assessed before you're being promoted. That's actually quite good because in a way, in my opinion, it's actually provided this scuff holding that's probably required for you to continuously learn to becoming, you know, the best in your particular field. But the thing is, I think we also kind of need that, you know, at a lower level, especially at higher institution kind of learning, yeah? No longer, because the world is becoming blurry in terms of boundaries. But whereas when we are still doing the teaching, I might be wrong, I might be right, yeah? Probably if I'm wrong, just correct me, yeah? Because I think we have to expand that a bit, yeah? Not too much into a box, this is what I do, and that's what you are doing, because there's a lot of similarity. Physics law, either you are mechanical engineer, chemical engineer, or electrical engineer, is still the same. Yeah. But how do you actually use that in an integrated manner is important. So that's one thing that I want to actually address it. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, uh, having kind of a continuous training and development programs with, with a very objectified kind of like assessment can actually help us to produce a more a grounded and more experienced talents in a fastest way. And when you assess them, meaning that you have to give them exposure, different, different function in the job scope, like what uh, I, our Kyrie mentioned just now. You can't just be a reservoir engineer, sit in a desk, yeah? If possible, you have to go to offshore to experience it. And you have to do, I mean, technician jobs and economist jobs, so on and so forth. That is actually quite important. So that's my point in terms of grooming the young talents and, you know, the young engineers in the field. Thank you, bro. All right. Thank you, Dr. Khaled. Maybe I would like to come in before uh, Dr. Salmi comes in just to update on what's going on in the curriculum in the universities coming from, okay, I have to mention I'm coming from University of Malaya. 
and we are recognized by ICME. Uh, I'm a, basically in the chemical engineering department. I think uh, you would know that through the Washington Accord, through the ICME, to be you know accredited, uh, you have to go beyond just the core courses, the physical laws. So we have sustainability engineering from year one right up to year four. And we have integrated engineering, but it can be done in a more interactive way. It's not, uh, I always believe it should be a process of diffusion and you know involvement with hands-on. So it's coming in slowly, but uh, there's more room for improvement. This is where we need industrial partnerships and so on, so that we have a living lab mode of doing final year research projects and so on. I would like to hand over to uh, Dr. Salmi. Uh, you know, what do industries expect from, uh, you know, graduates going to work in the workforce before we come to specific like green fuel and so on? So over to you. All right. Thank you, Professor. Uh, basically, I agree with Dr. Khalid. Uh, now we are in Tanaga, especially. We, we are preparing juniors engineers to thrive the challenging workforce involved in combination of technical skill, uh, soft skill and professional development. So uh, looking at the technical skill, uh, we're looking at the strong foundation, which is whatever field you are involved in, whether software engineer, mechanical engineer, we make sure you are very, uh, you, you have a good foundations. Uh, we're looking at the uh, engineers which are uh, willing to continue uh, learning, which is we encourage them to stay uh, updated with latest technologies and trend in their industries. So whatever updated industries apply in their field, they can be used and apply in the workforce. Uh, looking at the soft, soft skill, I think this is uh, quite uh, dominant to all the industries, uh, including the uh, all of the industries. Uh, communication, teamwork, adaptability, so this is most uh, we are looking for the young engineers. And the last but not least is uh, professional development. Uh, looking at this opportunity, we also want to develop the people uh, uh, with partnership, uh, mentorship, networking. Uh, we also go to the, uh, the, the, the culture, what, what we want to, to, to have the future, uh, leader in future. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Industry looking also looking at the technical proficiency, uh, problem solving skill, communication, adaptability that I have mentioned before, which is industry are constantly changing so engineers can adapt and adopt the, the latest technology, which is to comply what the current happen in the industry, industry now. Uh, for your information, uh, basically I am the uh, adjunct lecturer in uh, University of Technology Petronas. So uh, uh, lectures the student in engineering, economy and entrepreneurship. This is compulsory subject. So all uh, engineering students have to take this subject compulsory uh, pass. So this subject educate uh, student uh, uh, to apply this uh, economy and entrepreneurship, how to market their products. It's not only about the, the, the latest technology, the design, the engineering all about, but they have to meet all the requirements uh, required by industry, the current trending. And uh, we have to take into account uh, the principle of economic and how to sell these uh, things, the, the product to, the, to meet the customer demands. It's not only about the problem solving, but we also meet the people requirement and then meet the market demand uh, in order to achieve the successful of engineers to become engineers and entrepreneurship indirectly. So this is the, I think this is the, uh, the role placed by the educational uh, 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 education institute, which is can apply to all the uh, engineer students. Uh, addition to that, we also encourage uh, students uh, which is have the additional competency level for your information, uh, Professor Doctor, uh, basically I'm I'm from mechanical engineering, uh, but in the same time I have uh, my master business business admin administration. So this is my first master before I proceed with uh, master science in engineering. So, and in addition to that, uh, I also 
uh, hold the Doctor Business, Business Admin from University of Southern Malaysia, graduate in 2019. So when people ask me why I'm doing this uh, mechanical and same time I have the I'm holder of the mechanical engineering, basically is want to suit the the current market trending now. So I have the I have the hands on, as mentioned by Dr. Khalid, I'm not too too young, almost 40, 40 years old, uh, 13 years in power station, working in power station, and just transferred to the the uh, TMB fuel services and MSAT for almost three years. So during my uh, young engineers until up to senior managers, uh, we are looking for engineers who are willing to dirty the hands hands-on, uh, upskillings, at the same time, increase their competency indirectly. So looking at the ground, uh, competency level, uh, I'm not a good example, but uh, I hold the certain certificate, which is certified by authority bodies. For example, I, I hold the uh, steam engineer certificate by Dodge, which is required to operate the uh, pressure vessel boiler. At the same time, I have the CPET so. Uh, certificate competent person for influent uh, wastewater system uh, have a scrubber operation competency, competency certificate for a uh, scrubber operation in order and at the same time i i hold the uh, insurance certificate uh, by malaysian insurance institute so this all combination make you uh, make the engineers more valuable in future it's not only now, but in future, you are most valuable and uh, industry are looking at you. So that's all from me, uh, Doctor. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sami. In fact, I think you have answered the second question that's coming in on the Q&A, uh, which I can read. What about interpersonal skills for young engineers? I think Dr. Sami also touched that just now. To be trained and developed, especially in securing projects. Uh, he, he, you know, we always have this thing about communication skills and so on. <clears throat> that is why I think if I can share from chemical engineering department in University of Malaya for our laboratory uh, work, we have uh, communication skills as well. So they have to, you know, present their work before they actually go into the laboratory. After uh, laboratory, they have to present again. So it's a whole year process of, you know, telling people what they're doing. But now I think we have to come back to, uh, are there any other questions? That we are, you know, talking about tropical sciences. And I think I actually attended the Clim Climate Governance Malaysia debriefing of COP28. And the language that was being used, I don't know whether uh, you also joined the COP28 by CGC, that the good, the bad, and of COP28, and, you know, I think as engineers, we understand very well that the transition is so important. It's not like you can just go and close a pipeline and that's it. So, um, and the words that are being used at COP28 um, from the debriefing was coming down and some people see it as a weakening in the climate action because we're not talking about phasing out, phasing down, we're called transitioning now. So how, as engineers, we can contribute in science communication? Because as engineers, we understand it's not easy. You, you know, like I think Dr. Khaled was saying just now, uh, you know, in 2050, the last plan and so on. But how, how do we as engineers prepare, you know, for other group stakeholders, the private part, the partnership part, to make people understand it's not as easy in terms of energy transition um, to do away with, you know, some of this fuel. And what would be the better fuel? Uh, I think Dr. Sami Pati cakap tadi among some of the fuels that we can use. But in the uh, context of Malaysia, uh, what kind of renewable would be, you know, in terms, I don't know whether it's fair to ask the priority, uh, not what, you know, biomass has its issues. You were telling us about all the different challenges. But uh, for uh, each of us, uh, uh, for all the panelists, how, how would you like to see the green transition in tropical region? Maybe we can start back. I don't know, Dr. Sami wants to start first, then we will go on the panel. Uh, 
Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Professor. So basically, we we uh, before I proceed, I I think we we have to understanding the energy trilemma, a key challenge for energy transition, which is uh, looking at the security, equity, mm -hmm. and sustainability. Uh, security, uh, we are looking at the national capacity to meet the current and future energy demand, reliability. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, our energy demand is increased one to two percent every year, every year annually increase. So now, uh, in total, in Malaysia, we totally have we have a twelve thousand megawatt power generation coal, uh, power generation from coal, coal thermal plant. Uh, Increase of one percent uh, uh, of the energy required, basically uh, another one power station capacity about five hundred to one thousand megawatt. This is facts. Uh, looking at the equi equity, uh, ability to provide universal access to reliable, affordable, and abundant energy. Uh, kalau uh, if we see at the rural area, for example, they still use uh, uh, diesel, <laughs> which is a very very fossil fuel. Uh, high cost, uh, uh, difficult to access. So, is it fair to to the rural area if we want to implement this energy transition? So, we have we have to answer this. Uh, and and the last uh, the uh, energy trilemma is a sustainability sustainability of energy system, which is uh, represent the transition of this country uh, towards the avoiding of potential environment harm to climate change uh, impact. Uh, for example, if we say we want to to have the biomass as a, as a potential fuel. Uh, in fact, uh, not all uh, biomass can be a potential fuel. Uh, for example, biomass could be uh, a petty fruit bunch. For example, uh, we have a wood pellet, uh, EMB pellet, uh, paddy uh, rice husk. We have to concern about uh, the raw material resources, the supply chains. Uh, uh, looking at the rice high paddy, it's a seasonal area, seasonal seasonal uh, productions. Musim padi ada ada lah. Kalau tak ada, no no more no more no more pellet for from uh, rice husk. Uh, same goes to wood. Uh, wood become is is coming from furniture. It's coming from the from from from, from the tree basically. So is it fair fair enough to to cut the tree and 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 make it a pellet? Uh, uh, to, to, to fuel up and power generation. So this is the energy trilemma challenge uh, we have to face uh, into account. Uh, I, I just want to add, uh, what is the, basically uh, Malaysia uh, have a good step when we launch this uh, national energy transition phase one and phase two. Uh, looking at the phase one, we, we highlight the six catalyst project as I mentioned before, and then uh, uh, during the NETR phase two, uh, our prime minister uh, announced certain amount of money to be involved, which is uh, support by the financial system. Uh, but the thing is, uh, all the market player look, still looking at the execution of the program. Uh, uh, the MBF itself also looking at the uh, how uh, government want to enforce the regulatory and and, and policies uh, during embarking this uh, NETR phase one and phase two. So all this uh, energy trilemma, key challenge, and the uh, uh, the policy and regulators by by the government will be influenced towards to meet the uh, greener fuel for future in Malaysia, uh, especially. So that 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 is our our perspective now. Doctor. Okay. Okay, Prof. Can I add a little bit? I mean, just taking from uh, I R Salmi. I think thank you, I R Salmi, talking about the energy trilemma. But I think in Petronas, right? So I think uh, we, I mean, we believe, yeah, you, uh, the best fuel for energy transition is gas. You know, I mean, what we do with gas is basically, I mean, of course, I mean, as is, there's a lot of change that you have to do because we also look into the supply and demand, right? So in Malaysia, unfortunately, we do have quite a significant number of uh, gas reserves. Unfortunately, the CO2 content is quite high. Yeah. So what we need to make it greener, I mean, basically, you need to implement uh, basically carbon capture and sequestrations. So then you can produce the, uh, the, the gas without, you know, the, the release of CO2 as emissions. So the CCUS projects, potentially, if you have read the newspaper, for example, Kawak, Kawak, 
Kasawari project is in place right now that's being developed with Sarawak and other uh, parties too. So that's quite big, yeah, because uh, we believe gas is much better um, uh, fuel for energy transitioning compared to oil or even compared to coal, yeah. I mean, of course, I think uh, with some uh, alleged in terms of the cost, I know uh, it's probably, it's probably more expensive than coal, yeah. But that's important. And of course, I think uh, it's quite key nowadays each one of the energy players, they do have a pledge yeah, in terms of sustainable aspiration. For Petronas, for example, we have what we call as MFT 50-30-0, uh, moving forward together. And I just want to focus on zero. yeah. Petronas pledge by 2050, its operation will be uh, net carbon zero emissions. yeah. So that doesn't mean that we don't really CO2, but in terms of the total, the net, we try to make it um, net zero. There is no carbon release from our operations. That's important. So of course, I mean, uh, a lot of uh, the effort now is being taken to, to enhance or to enable technologies at you know reasonable cost to be deployed to ensure the capture, the storage, and in some cases, the utilization of CO2, and also the conversion of other renewable energy is actually taken taken place. Like for example, hydrogens from electrolyzer, solar energy, wind energy, wherever possible. But what more important over there, I think there is no single solution for moving forward. We need to have what we call energy mix. Yeah. I mean that you need to have energy mix as the I mean as the feedstock to your energy bucket. And then you have to develop a proper and profitable energy distributions to your customer. Because IR Salmi that mentioned just now, I mean, for our challenge, right, for example, there are certain rural areas that probably it's not economical for you to have a gas pipeline, for example. So how can you provide, um, you know, some energy solutions that is cleaner, yeah? But I think even from COP28, yeah, especially relatable to tropic areas, we should read it beyond the first line of what is being the statement of COPs, yeah? But if you really look into it, what is being designed that way, so that everybody can have their own energy transition journey that is just and equi equitable to all, right? Because the solution for Norway, for example, if you're going to apply it to Malaysia or Indonesia, it's just not making sense, you know? You don't, you can't do it. So we have to find, and I think this is the role of engineers, how we can make the energy transition as adjust and equitable and uh, for us to, 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 move the, uh, to move the sustainability agenda. How can we do that? And I think that's an important, and I think all the energy players, I think even TNB and Petronas Research, there is some collaboration, we just across the road to each other for years, yeah? So now we have active engagement because we are all in the energy sectors and we're trying to find the right solution that you know benefits for the whole society. Thank you. I, I think uh, we're coming to the last question, but I would like to comment on the uh, responses that we have gone so far from uh, engineers Dr. Salmi and Dr. Khalid. I would like to throw in the word innovation. Even though you said we have the energy trilemma, but can engineers be innovative enough like you say, TCU, PAKA, PEM, uh, and, and so on. I, I, I think engineers, when really challenged to it, can rise to the occasion. Because when you were saying biomass, you said uh, there's no rise, then there's no, um, you know, has to do it. But now people are talking about a rise all the year round. So there's always this innovation aspect that we should be working on. But uh, we have to come to the last okay. question, and I'm going to read from the uh, uh, chat box Q&A, and maybe uh, the perfect person will be engineer Khairi <laughs> to answer this. Of course, the rest are all uh, you know, welcome. Salam and good day, panelists. Thank you for the great sharing. I have one question regarding today's topic. What is the most challenging part when dealing with our new generation of too much, in inverted comma, Reliance on the technology, less resilient and less interest in job, specifically related to the engineering field. 
nak kena baca sekali lagi ke? Mm-hmm. Boleh, boleh. We can read. Uh, you get the gist of the question? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think before I answer that question, I just want to add on uh, uh, some okay. question just now. Kan? I think I, I remember when I was a young engineer last time, kan? my boss says, Khairi, you must convince them first. If you, you cannot convince them, you confuse them. <laughs> It sticks to my mind. What does it actually entails? It tells me basically, in order for you to convince somebody, this communication, you must understand their language, their interpretations, not your interpretations. As an engineer, we are very comfortable with the language, with the term that we are familiar with. Sometimes we dictate those uh, language, the sentences, can the words, the paragraph, can, to them, can. in which case they don't understand. The finance guy don't understand, the HR guy don't understand, the technicians don't understand, and you thought that you were smart. Can. In fact, basically, you feel in the first place that you cannot convince them. Can. <laughs> then only if can, they are, you're already there trying to talk to their language they don't understand, then only you start talking the technical terms. Can. You start to confuse them. Because nobody can challenge you because you start talking all the gibberish. Right? <laughs> Only the engineers understand. Gonna, gonna. So that's a way my, my first learning sir, is a, is a how to influence people. Right? is to understand their language. Right? In, with that, right? all engineers must know other people's language. Right? We must not just understand how we talk. We must understand how to make things simple to the language of their men. Right? That will, I think, go to go to the next points I would like to come see. Right? It was basically, yes. We talk about energy transition. You know? We talk about uh, what we want to do. You know? But we always talk about the supply side. You know? I always, I work since many years now, 10 years, etc. You know, to train energy managers, etc. One thing that I always ask them is basically we must teach the people how to be efficient in the energy consumption. Last 10 years was very hard for me, you know, just to get the industries to be conservative, you know, to be efficient in the way they, they talk. You know? But now, today, you know, the energy prices are going up, skyrocketing. Now, everybody comes in. Sometimes you need that kind of language for them to understand the importance of energy. You know. It is not very simple just to get everything for energy. You know. But we have to change the behavior as well. You know. We change the way that we consume energy. You know. Because if we still keep on wasting energy, that will always a problem you know, to meet that demand. You know. Because we don't control the demands. Uh. As engineers, we are uh, fractions of the society. So. But as a whole society, we must be able to communicate the importance of energy efficiency you know, in order for us to develop and change to our transition to energy. You know. The third point I would like to answer is uh, now, you know, we as engineers, you know, we should not be you know, dealt to uh, oil and gas or uh, uh, of, uh, or, or the, uh, the hydros, etc., the, the common sense. Uh. But we really have to think again, as of course, researchers and professionals you know, is to use our conditions. You know. We have to look into our environment. You know. What is available in our environment and then that suited to the energy? What can we tap from those atom? I think those questions you should ask. You know. I think again, basically, good. this is a question that I'm sure engineers come to. You know. We should not say hey, we must still basically try to minimize it. Because eventually, if there's no oil and gas there again, in our, our oil waters, again, we have to be different. Again. We have to work differently. Again. So we should we should we should we still tap on those uh, resources or can we tap from other resources? Again? What is available in the environment? Again? Is the wave again? is the attack ocean uh, thermal uh, uh, potentials again? Uh, is the wind potentials again? Can we tap is a much more cheaper one? Again? Uh, can that become so? It, these are questions uh, that we must come on thinking uh, to transition uh, because we know that our uh, the energy will not will always be there. Uh, energy is always there, uh, but the source, as I said, uh, may, may not be as simple to uh, acquire anymore. Uh, so that would be a challenge. Uh, so I think that's additional to the to the question. Uh, but to this this uh, this this question, uh, this is question which is very pertinent. Uh, to uh, uh, I'm Gen X and uh, I'm the Gen X and uh, and it's Gen Y and now the Gen Z is millennial etc. Can these are the people who are born? Uh, 
So these are the people who are born now, you know, with gadgets on their hands. You know. These are people who they want to ask, have issues, they ask Google. You know. These are the generations where they want to understand something, they just watch YouTube and see animations. You know. I always see basically the difference between the young engineers and, and I when I learned. You know. Last time I had to read books. I have to start imagining how turbine works, you know, how the energy transfers. You know. I have lots of imagination you know, because there's no kind of, kind of visual cues that people learn. You know. These are the generations where things come easily to the labs. These are challenges. You know. This is a challenge to my children as well, you know, because they thought it's easier. You know. Last times I need to go to the library. Now library to go to your phone. You know. <laughs> now people like this is now they ask AI to write for you. Well. Not even most can you, you go and search for that. But we, we, we miss the fundament. How can we deal with it? Again? I think this is a generation issues. Again. These are real generation issues. How comes it? This obviously this is the things that make uh, that make engineers are not exciting. Again. And for many of us as well, we don't make engineers exciting. Again. We don't talk to again. none of my none of my children become engineers. Again. That that's unfortunate. Again. Yeah, none of all my footsteps kind of talking about other people like, as much as can because they don't see that with the ideas. We see other things. Then. Should, should we have to mix uh, uh, stamps again, like, uh, engineering as an uh, as exciting place to be? Like, we have to put uh, the students to the field, just not just purely on, uh, on a virtual world like, uh, and sit on their laps and having uh, little things. Like, but we, we have to put them in the fields and enjoy life. You know? you gotta go back to the green. You know? Go hiking and see what's the real world. world you know? Understand what physics is all about. You know? uh, we have to understand that physics is exciting uh, to explore. Understanding the world is explore. I think this is a real issue. You know? When when the, the generations come in, uh, like information to the labs. Uh, but the question is that, that I think that the next session we'll have is basically, uh, since you just accepting the information coming from uh, your your screen you, know, you will never know that it's right or wrong you know, because you have not the experience to say it's right or wrong there are plenty of information if you ask you type one one issues there are thousands of information there what is right is wrong you know? uh, as what what Dr. Khaled says basically a, a solution in Norway may not be even a solution to us you know? you know? uh, I've seen so many issues design issues uh, installation issues it means basically they follow American standards or Australian standards or uh, but uh, uh, Japanese experience, but it totally fails in this country. You know? So again, with engineers, you know, we must we must be there. You know? So how 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 are answers are really very hard to answer. You know? But I think it's all bottom up to education system. You know? How we mix all together. I think uh, universities are a bit too late. You know? I think universities are too late to to address these issues. You know? I think it has to come to from primary schools, uh, pre pre kindergarten, you know, to uh, to take away the gadgets from the students. You know? Uh, use the minds rather than uh, last time we we, we use uh, 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 graph papers to make a graph and tabulate the whole lot. Kind of. Now we excel, we don't need to do that. Kind of. So we, we lack the fundamentals. I think this is the issue to we lack the fundamental and the student will have a real challenge again. Kind of. I think this is our biggest challenge in getting the, the new generations comes in. I think that's the answer. Kind of. I think it's still education system and how we should perceive uh, but, uh, physics or uh, engineering uh, as exciting problem solving issues rather than uh, just a uh, glamorous one. But there's one more thing, uh, we, we have not created uh, 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 influencers. Uh, uh, influencers, uh, now we talk about social media, uh, we are not created influencers. Uh, we don't put uh, uh, Prof. Uh, Emeritus Bazlan as, uh, as our influencer, uh, uh, Prof. Nick uh, as influencers. Uh, Oh, Dr. Khalid lah, as influencers, kan? Dr. Salmi as influencers, kan? Kan? We, we don't have that kind of influencers, kan? We all talk in our own world, kan? So, we, can't, kan? we, we have to engage uh, the young kan? and talk to their language, not to our language. Kan? I think this is the key, go, go back to the, to the, the, the communications. Kan? We have to talk to their language. Kan? That is the key takeaway for me. That's all. Okay, uh, thank you so much to all the panelists. You know, at the end of every of my own class, I always ask some students to come up with three keywords to take away. You know, not lengthy ones. Uh, but I don't think I can do that to our esteemed panelists. 
Um, but I know uh, things that come up will be lifelong learning. We have gone away very much from just energy issues, young technical. We have gone beyond. Uh, I, I believe today we have gone to lifelong learning, system thinking, uh, you know, who is really an engineer and so on. And I think we should also, all of us should challenge ourselves as well. Innovation is an important part. Maybe the innovation in this case is not just technical. Maybe the innovation for, you know, engineers who have the experience, uh, like all of us who are here, who have gone through the mill, sort of, is how to become an influencer. Yes. Right? Maybe agree, ASF agree. can, we, can we come up with a, re a reality show <laughs> somewhere. Uh, you know, I have... You know, I've heard from some friends in the media before that they are willing to to fund a reality show that works on technology. Maybe I should be talking to him mm. uh, about this idea, you know, making influencer out of te uh, technical people so that, you know, we can talk to the language and so on. So I hope uh, Dr. Khaled, Engineer Khairi and Dr. Sambi are prepared <laughs> when the time comes <laughs> and for, for the reality show. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think uh, it's time for me to express sincere gratitude. But before that, we would like to commemorate with a picture, if you don't mind. Uh, I think the MC said, Boleh ambil gambar kita orang je ke? Yeah. Only four of us. Only, yeah, then you, you can put in your LinkedIn or whatever, you, you know, to be on the way to becoming an influencer. <laughs> okay, are, are we ready? Okay, one. Okay, ASM will be sharing that with you. And I would like to express then, uh, I, I wouldn't think I want to summarize anything. I think we have a very fruitful session. Uh, more should be in the work, especially in terms of the tropical side. We delve not only into the technology, we have gone beyond technology. So really, once again, I would like to express sincere gratitude terima kasih to our panelists for joining today. Your participation and engagement um, from the panelists as well as the participants in driving the conversation forward. And we look to see on another occasion where we can have a, a more innovative way of also talking and so on. So a uh, good day. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and over to the MC. Waalaikumsalam. <laughs> making this program a success. I would like to remind the audience that this webinar is a pre-conference event of the International Conference on Tropical Sciences, TropSci 2024. We have more pre-conference webinars coming soon, so please join us next time. That's all from us today. Thank you, and we'll see you next time. All speakers, thank you.